the clothes, the extremely uh, cut clothes with the the uh, the tight bosoms, the swelling skirts. The, the, the high tailoring of the clothes mm -hmm. or the actual shape? The shape of the them fundamental too. fundamental shape of them. Because the way they're shaped, the long, the long waistcoats for the men and then the, the tight-fitting overcoats with the skirts, the, the great cuffs, the lace. And the long, uh, the long waistcoats and the extreme cuffs, mm -hmm. where did, how did they arrive on the scene? Well, and what does that say about me being? All of these are imitated from the French court. And as time goes on, the waistcoats will get shorter, the coats will get longer. And that's as you move into the 18th century. But these are very carefully tailored and they demand that you stand in a certain way because yourself is a work of art. The way you stand, the way you display your body is part of your social presence, part of your reality. And so you make the most of all of your best qualities. The hand will have all its various rings and so on. Um, you flick the wrist and let the lace shake. Um, and you have to stand and move and sit in very particular ways because they're very tightly corseted. Men and women could be tightly corseted. And so you don't loll. You they, did, they were corseted because they didn't like a paunch or thinness was in. Why would the men corset? Oh, to, to remain youthful looking. Ah. Absolutely. Okay. And to remain military looking. Yes. Uh, and the ladies, of course, very, very tightly corseted. And militarism was a, a fashion? Yeah, well, a... yeah. And it was, it was one, of the, one of the accepted professions. Sure. It, it gives you that status. Because you got to ride beautiful horses. Oh, absolutely. Balls. Horsemanship is, is part of being a gentleman. Fight a very Horsemanship, gallant battle. Dancing. Dancing. You, you, you learn to dance practically as soon as you learn how to walk. And dancing is elaborate and beautiful, but it's not done in order to express something. It's or done in order to demonstrate absolute control over every muscle in the body. And again, if we look at our atelier yep. with Jeanette's work, you can see that absolutely placement of yes. every yes, every the detail is just immense, and the the uh, the uh, opposition of one side of the body to the other, and uh, all of that is is beautifully beautifully done. The little the demi coupe where you just barely touch the heel as as you pass, all of those things are part of that. And was that as uh, uh, intricate and exquisite in the English culture as yeah. it was in the French? Oh yes, it was taken right over. And they, they brought in gentlemen, they brought in French dancing masters to teach them. But the English never looked to cook, learned to cook, so how could they learn to dance? Yeah, well, the, the two didn't seem to, uh, the, the, the cooking, that bully beef, just a great big roast of beef, and that'll do it. Um, they didn't, uh, didn't uh, have much truck with vegetables except out in the country. But all of that is, is part of, of what goes into it. And architecture? Architecture, yes, yes, certainly. The, uh, the, um, especially after the fire, the building of London again. Um, so to decorate, Baroque is, is extreme decoration. And you're decorating yourself. Right? Yep. Your body is, is part of, your body is a work of art. You're showing that. And it means the way you stand, the way you move, the way you perch on the edge of a chair. And of course, you have to, a general has to manipulate his sword. The sword is always there. Right. That's always got to be part of it. And everything is done easily. 
gracefully. The upper class, the aristocratic. Yeah, that's not the lower class, not the servants, no, but not that's, the rustics. That's somebody else, yes, yes. You stand with the weight on one foot and the other foot extended and showing your goods, showing that you've got a good calf. And then you can shift the weight from one foot to the other as you're, as you're making a, a point. You can go forward and then retreat and move on to another foot. But all of that is part of the dance. And song? Do you and take song. the students through song? Absolutely. Music is an essential part of it. And there is a lot of good stuff, good, good stuff, choral music and solo songs and popular songs of a rather um, obscene nature. We have some of those too. So ballad room songs. And how many weeks will, then, will you spend uh, with students working on this kind of project? When I first began doing them, um, it was, I, I, I would do one in about six weeks. Uh, since I've been here at Ryerson, I've, uh, Perry gives, gives me them third years for the whole winter term, wow. the entire winter term, which means I can do an awful lot more detail work. And uh, the period study is, apart from a study of the background, and originally, in the early days, I would have students do particular research. They would pick, take a topic, one topic, and they would research into that topic, and they would bring that research into class, not as research, but as the lived experience of some person from that period and speak in the first person and tell them, tell us about their concerns, about their interests, about what they are thinking about in terms of the way the nation is going, right. that kind of thing. And out of that then would come little improvisations. And I used to use those improvisations as part of the period study presentation. But there were always a number of plays from the period. I wanted them to have a variety of styles from the heroic rhetorical, uh, something like Dryden or Elkanah Settle or one of those. Um, we would have the, the, uh, the old comedy. Such as? Well, such as Witcherly or Congrave. Right or uh, uh, George Etheridge. And those are diamond hard, and they draw blood. The comedy is serious. The comedy is absolutely dry-eyed. And one laughs to scorn the ridiculous characters in the comedy with no quarter given whatsoever. Are you talking about Country Wife? A country wife, yes, yes, absolutely. And if we move forward to something like She Stoops to Conquer, which is a bit later, is it not? That is a, a whole century later. Right. And there you have... Um, so we're 17... 70, 70s? 70s. 75, 7, yeah. And we have rustic characters in as well as well as yeah. our. Well, that, you see, that's a whole a whole century has passed, in which the age of reason, so called, has 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 <laughs> retreated. That's so cool. And, yeah, because in the 17th century, one had discovered one's rational mind. This was the tool of cognition that we had. And we begin gradually to lay aside all the teachings and the superstitions of, the, of medieval religiosity. And we are coming to a new understanding of the world around us by scientific study and research and sharing of that research. That goes on into the 18th century. And in the 18th century, the word nature itself changes its, its uh, meaning in the 16th and 17th centuries, nature meant la nature humaine, the nature of human beings. 
in the 18th century, nature begins to mean that physical world that surrounds human beings, the world on which we live. Right. And we begin to realize that that world is a whole lot older than uh, doctrine had told us, that in fact we are much less important in the world and much older and much more eternal are the trees and the hills and the rocks and the seas. And is Romanticism creeping in here? Only, only toward the very end, because first of all, we begin to realize that maybe the brain alone is not enough. We can get into all kinds of difficulties and contradictions with just using the brain. But there are other things that mean, that give meaning to, that give uh, uh, our humanity, that mean our humanity. We have souls, we have our emotions. Those emotions were held in check while we were relying only on our brains.